Um, let's go ahead and, and get this session started. Uh, Mayte has nicely uh, agreed to come back again this year and teach us more about primary immune deficiency. I think I made up this title. I didn't know you were going to take it seriously. Um, what I didn't tell you last year. I forgot what you told us last year. But <laughs> that's my problem. So, <laughs> let's go ahead. Well, I'm delighted to be here again. Um, yeah, so I thought it was an interesting title because, um, you know, some people are new, and so the question is, do you want to repeat what you said last year, or do you want to give that last year's talk uh, to, it's mainly to our fellows in a different way. Perhaps we can do it in a different way. Um, so, um, this is my disclosure slide, and the what I told you last year is that if you look at the the IUIS, which is the International Union of Immunologic Societies, they put out uh, a paper with uh, compiling all the immune deficiencies in the in the last uh, and, and every two years or so. And there's been an incredible exponential increase in the different forms of immune deficiency. Uh, given that uh, we have new um, technologies and the advancements of uh, genetic testing has really changed the way we, we um, sort of perceive um, many of these diseases. And what's happening is that um, now we're recognizing novel phenotypes uh, of classic diseases. So we're seeing patients with skid presenting in their late uh, childhood years, uh, maybe um, adolescent years, and even uh, in, a, in adulthood in some of the some rare cases of, uh, for example, RAD deficiencies. But we've also learned that not only we've always thought about these inward errors of the immunity as um, defects and loss of function of, the, of proteins encoded by unique genes, but we have learned also through um, uh, sequencing and functional studies that there are many diseases that perhaps may have both uh, genes that may have loss of function or gain of function. For example, the, the STAT3 is a classic one where you have loss of function of STAT3 gives you the hyper IgE or Job syndrome phenotype, whereas gain of function of STAT3 gives you a, a, um, a clinical phenotype of systemic autoimmunity with lymphoproliferation, um, so a, a, a feature of uh, immune dysregulation. So there are, um, so obviously I can't go over 350 different genes and different diseases. Um, and so last year what I did is uh, the classically dividing all the primary immunodeficiencies mainly as antibody deficiency syndromes as you can see here. Let me see if I'm waiting correctly. Laser pointer. Oh, what happened? No. I didn't. No. I did something wrong. <laughs> Let me Sorry. Anyway, so what you can see here in the blue are the antibody deficiency syndromes. Um, and uh, these encompass pretty much uh, more than 50% of the different uh, immunodeficiencies. Um, then there are your well defined syndromes, which um, and these include mainly your Wiscots or your George syndrome, um, the combined immune deficiencies. But all of these together really uh, are associated with antibody deficiencies. There's a, for the most part, most of these patients are going to need um, some uh, gamma globulin replacement therapies. Your auto inflammatory disorders, defects in phagocytes. Uh, immune dysregulation, which is really has increased in some of the defects of innate immunity um, that we are trying to um, recognize. And so last year, what I focused par primarily are on the antibody deficiency syndromes, and I presented cases where we talked about XLA and gave you some updates on um, not only what you should know about XLA, but uh, what has happened, what happens to these patients as they enter adulthood and what are the things you need to um, watch out for, um, what are the um, long-term um, 
uh, um, outcomes of some of these patients. So mainly focused on XLA, we focused on CBID or two of the uh, diseases. So um, uh, today I'm going to um, talk about uh, a different group of diseases, um, but also within the classic. Uh, okay. Let me ask you a question. In a metropolitan area of this size, if you add up all of those, how many patients are there? In King County, or Western Washington. So, if you take as a group all of the immune deficiencies, it used to be thought that maybe one in 10,000. But if you include um, IgA deficiencies, of uh, which may be one in 700, um, you're, the numbers should be much less. So, probably anywhere between one in 1,000 or one to 10,000, probably one in 5,000 or so. And there's not really been a very, there's not good prevalence um, for some reason. Yeah. Um, there's not a, a, a good prevalence numbers that we, that we have, but the, these are estimates that um, have been published in, in this era. Maybe 10, 20 years ago, maybe it was thought one in 10,000, but in this era, maybe one in, in four to 5,000. Well, I don't, just on, I don't know the population. 2,000 per million would be 1,000 per million. So this area is, yeah, so it's about 5,000 or 6,000. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm going to, again, just want to go over <laughs> clinical patterns um, because at the end of the, the day, that's what we're seeing are the patients that are coming to see us. I'm going to talk a little bit about the interpretation of how uh, certain laboratories that you mean that you need for um, diagnosis and um, recognize some of the treatment modalities, the dilemmas and the lack of consensus in some of the um, sort of monitoring and what strategies people are doing. And I'm going to show this um, through case studies. So this is um, the first case we're going to talk about. And I'm going to give you two different cases, um, and I'm going to ask you if you think that they're the same disease. So the first one is a male that I saw at the age of 14. And at the age of four, he had been diagnosed with patient pneumonia and underwent a left, lower, uh, left lobectomy. At age eight, he was diagnosed with nocardia pneumonia um, and had a right lung biopsy after that's the way the diagnosis was made. And then at age 11, he had aspergillus pneumonia, which was complicated by a pulmonary AVM malformation. And then by age uh, 14, he presented with persistent lymphadenitis. So I'm going to, what do you guys think in general? CGD. Okay, CGD. Very good. Now I'm going to show you a different case. And these patients have the same disease, and so you're going to tell me. This is a six-month-old little girl who was admitted for fevers and diarrhea, and she wasn't gaining very well. Um, the only, uh, she's had prior infections. At a month of age, she had a labial abscess that had MRSA. And then at four months, she was admitted with a right lower lobe pneumonia and um, treated with broad-spectrum antibiotics and didn't you know, no, no pathogens were identified. And so she gets admitted. Um, this is her chest x-ray here. You can see this infiltrate here. And this is right here. And it's this, again, it's in the right, um, in the right uh, lower lobe, right middle lobe. There's some concern about pneumatocy information. What do you think? Do these two have the same disease? And what are the clinical features and the red flags. There's different sex, so think about that. Okay, so they're, so if they're the same disease, it has to be a disease that is both X-linked or autosomal recessive, right? And the first one you told me was CGD, right? What about this? Could this be CGD? <clears throat> yeah, I'm not a female. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. This is CGD. The first one was X-linked form. This child has an autosomal recessive form. 
So, um, so things to remember about uh, chronic granulomatous disease, and that is there are both X-linked form and autosomal recessive forms. And these patients usually present with uh, lung, liver, um, lymphadenitis, not uncommonly. Um, you have skin infections, um, skin abscesses sometimes. These are the, the, the uh, with a lot of sort of pus, the neutrophils just stay there. Um, they can present with osteomyelitis as a first presentation. It's very rare that CGD patients are bacteremic, actually, interestingly. You don't really see that. Um, lymphadenitis is one of the common presentation, and liver abscesses is CGD until proven otherwise um, in, in adults. As you move into the adolescent and the young adults, and certainly the adults, um, gingivitis is one of the common, common features, and they um, invariably have periodontal disease. Mucosal ulcerations are not uncommon. And if you take care of children that then move into adults and you know that the uh, mom's a carrier, you should be watchful because moms can present and the carriers can present with clinical features if there's complete lionization and her neutrophil um, start um, uh, uh, inactivating the wrong X um, uh, in, their, in their neutrophils. So you, you can see clinical phenotypes, and we diagnosed uh, uh, my you know, anecdotal experiences, uh, a woman in her 40s with uh, um, aspergilloma um, in the right upper lobe. So these are diagnoses that you should still, the, the pathogen is going to be the clue. Um, the general treatment for patients with CGD is the uh, use of the antibiotics. Uh, prophylaxis uh, for staff because it's one of the most common one. Um, the group at NIH demonstrated in double-blind studies that interferon gamma um, is helpful in terms of number of infections. Um, but I'll show you um, in a couple of slides that um, as people have moved on um, in the last 20 years, there's been a push towards more definitive therapies with hematopoietic uh, stem cell transplants. And um, and more recently, uh, gene therapy. <laughs> that held up that gamma interferon is useful. I, I thought that was controversial. Well, so the the, the Europeans won't use it um, because it, amongst the co the the cost that it, it requires, and so they feel that there's really not um, that uh, excessive, you know, advanced benefit. Um, but uh, in the U.S., most centers we use it based on that clinical. There's only one that clinical trial that uh, NIH put out, Steve Palmer put out. Okay, but the subsequent data show that it is effective. Yeah, yeah, it can. Yes. So um, the key here, and that's why I think, uh, as a clinician, uh, knowing what the pathogens are is really helpful because it really tells you. Um, you know, what what arm of the immune system you have to think about. So the things that you've learned in medical school is uh, to remember SPACE as your acronym for knowing what are the pathogens that patients with chronic granulomatous disease have. And it just so happens that that is the word of the day as well. So staph, pseudomonas, oh aspergillus, candida, and, uh, and enterobacter are very common. Pseudomonas so, has been renamed as that name? What's that? Pseudomonas and known forever. Is that the new name for it? It's no, no, no. Oh, um, wow. It's one of the the types of pseudomonas, Percularia. It's, that's one of the most common ones that you're seeing. And that's one of the ones that our patient had actually. So why do they make up a new name for it? Um, I don't they know. They we should have to yeah, ask the. Genetically, uh, genetically I, when, they can, <laughs> when they can cite it out genetically, they can make a better accurate association with other species. It's like a pain in the ass. <laughs> Science yeah. is that way. A pain in the ass. Right. So, um, things uh, that you didn't learn in medical school are these very rare other pathogens that have been reported in these patients. And many of these pathogens, it's really hard to even pronounce. 
Chromobacterium violaceum. Um, it's, uh, you can get it from some of the warm uh, brackish waters and think of uh, a Disney World. Um, Paleocylomyces species and the granulo, uh, gran Granulobacter benedensis was described in 2004 by a group of NIH. And so our little girl, um, is that's what she had. Uh, and that was based only on a lung biopsy. Um, and it wasn't based on anything else. So it's the- Excuse me, the other organisms we're not familiar with, do they have a different pattern? To no, they they can present usually lung disease for the most part, and these um, and that's how they get uh, identified through biopsies for the, many times. <clears throat> One of the things about the granulobacter is that it can recur months and years afterwards, and so that the the patients that were first reported uh, from the NIH were patients in their 30s and. Um, with the history of chronic granulomatous disease, a history of weight loss and pulmonary infiltrates um, that really was very recalcitrant to any type of therapies. Um, and um, so until they actually did biopsies and then they um, did PCR with the 16S PCR, they started identifying a group of these um, pathogen and in, in similar characteristics in some of these patients, mainly adult patients with CGD, developed recurrence of the same pathogen several months later. So treatments required months to almost a year, one of the patients uh, with a susceptible. It's usually very susceptible. It's, you, you know, Omnicef, you can treat them for long, but you have to treat it for a long time. And our patient got treated uh, for, um, for eight months straight to be able to to clear and she didn't have recurrence, so she went to transplant afterwards. Mm -hmm. But so just to remind you, this is the same patient who um, the, the little girl who then subsequently developed this serratia, disseminated serratia, and this is what you see, these sort of um, uh, nodules with uh, necrotic centers, um, which were very extensive, and she presented with the ones on her neck. Uh, but, the, the defect in patients with chronic granulomatous disease, all of you know, is uh, a defect in your NADPH oxidase system. And um, there are lots of different components. At the end of the day, the phagolysosomes comes together, and um, the goal is to produce the superoxides to, to make ba basically bleach within these phagolysosomes, right? Um, and so the different components are your GP91, which is associated with your X-linked form, um, and P22, uh, 40, 67, and 47 are all associated with autosomal recessive form. Of the most common one is the X-linked form. The P22 is the second most common. P47 is the third most common. P67 is um, very rare, and that's the one that our patient had. Uh, and P40 is also rare. <coughs> P47 is fairly not, um, uh, these patients tend to have um, a, a little milder disease, and you can uh, make the diagnosis later on. Um, these tend to present in, um, in adolescent uh, period. In terms of laboratory studies, um, the classic one that you learned, uh, that most of us, except for the young people, in medical school was the reduction of nitroblue tetrazolium, which is no longer used. Um, and um, what is used today is uh, dehydrorhodamine um, by flow cytometry. And we talk, I'll talk about treatment in a minute, but I just wanted to show you for a historical fact. Um, this is a typical picture um, that uh, Steve Holland shared with me about uh, with, uh, the neutrophil oxidative burst. So the nitro blue tetrazolium is uh, um, a dye that is really um, sort of a yellowish uh, dye that um, in when when it's um, when it's engulfed by normal neutrophils it is oxidized and it gets this dark blue color so what you can see in the slide is these are all neutrophils with this black stuff in them um, this is a patient that is unable to oxidize uh, the nitroblue tetrazolium so you see no um, dark 
um, little um, deposition. And this is a carrier where you see two, two populations. Those are the, the, the ones that carry the defect and the ones that uh, don't carry the defect. Um, and, and this is you know, what we used to look at in, in the laboratory. And the reality is that you have to be a laboratory and a person that has a lot of experience to see this, because if any of you have looked at uh, blood smears, it's very difficult unless you have a trained eye to look at this. So um, the, the nitro, um, the dehydrorhodamine 123 is the um, principal um, uh, sort of flow-based assay that is now used. And um, this, this uh, um, dehydrorhodamine um, is, is, um, is able to um, freely enter the cells. Um, and um, and it's taken up by the phagolysosomes once the um, the cells are activated with PMA, and then once they it, it is oxidized, it will um, fluoresce, and so that's how you can um, measure it by flow cytometry. And this is your control, and this is uh, the 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 normal expression of that fluorescence. Um, this is the X. Uh, Links CGD, where you can see there's no change um, in that fluorescence. And this is a carrier where you can see two different populations, some that are able to fluoresce and some that are not. And so this is a fairly quick um, assay. The turnaround time is very fast, and it's a, a very accurate and very good. However... Would the carrier be symptomatic? Does it have enough no, functioning? No, that's enough. Yeah, yeah. So um, having said that, I think that there are a couple of things that one has to remember uh, when you order these nitro, uh, uh, neutrophil oxidative person. That is, the most laboratories will say that the stability of the, uh, of the sample is about 48 hours. But, but if you think about it, neutrophils, their half-life is about two days, right? And so you have to keep them in a nice media to keep them alive. Um, and so, optimally, the samples should be run within 24 hours. So, um, try not to order tests, you know, on Fridays, and um, and if they have to be shipped, um, it, it be mindful of, of that. Um, it's also very important to, especially in laboratories that are not familiar with these tests, to make sure that they that you may tell them the, with what type of test tube that that needs to be collected. Um, if the sample is hemolyzed, you're going to have a very high background. If the patients are um, septic, you can have already degranulation, a lot of um, degranulation of these neutrophils, and so you may not see a nice fluorescent, um, so you'll see that background um, as well, and so you, you may get an abnormal result and not be uh, clear. Patients with complete myeloperoxidase deficiency can give you also an abnormal uh, test as well because it's part of your fibrolysosome. And if you if the, the sample is not ideal, it could give you a, a false positive result. The other patients that are very important to remember are patients with G6PD deficiency. So your G6PD is a substrate for your NADPH. And so what can happen in, uh, is that you can have um, persistent, if you have persistent infection and they are not be able to clear, you can have a decrease in your neutrophil oxidative burst as well. So something to, to think about um, when you're ordering these tests. When you say myeloperoxidase gives you a false positive, I mean, if you don't have myeloperoxidase, you don't make oxidative species adequately, don't you get much the same clinical disease? Yeah, but it's a much, much milder, and your NADPH is a much more potent, so it really compensates. Patients with myeloperoxidase deficiencies very rarely have um, the same clinical phenotype. The other way to look at it is uh, um, to, to actually do your Western prod assays. Uh, unfortunately, this is not something that is available clinically on a regular basis, but I just wanted to point and show you this because um, this, is your, this is your GP91, um, your P67, uh, 47 and 22, and you can see our patient had absolutely absence of this, um, of the, of the 
uh, 67 components. So we have to be thinking as we move forward, especially with a lot of the genetic uh, availability and, and genetic tests and variants of unknown significant, we need to be thinking about what uh, assays we have um, to look at the protein level and how to incorporate that in our thinking process. Yeah. What would be the cost of that test? This is a research test, so this is not clinically available. But we have to be thinking of developing, and so the proteonomics is an opportunity where you could potentially start looking at um, protein expression. And the folks uh, here at the UW are looking at uh, uh, proteinomics for uh, proteins like BTK, for proteins like that are easily identified by flow, and, and they're going to start looking at it for newborn screening too. But I think there's a value in that for diagnostic purposes because if you have a you know a mutation that is a new mutation, because then you know you have to demonstrate that this mutation is <clears throat> clinically um, functional, functionally has a significance, right? So I think. I think that we need to be thinking about, you know, not um, uh, looking at uh, other ways of, uh, of uh, functional studies. So, um, so I told you about the treatment, um, and I also told you about the fact that uh, in the last uh, probably 20, uh, 10, 15 years, there's been a push towards hematopoietic stem cells transplant and a push towards gene therapy for these patients. And the question is why? So these are some uh, long-term studies that have been published in patients with CGD. And this is a, a series from France. Um, they, these are adult patients with CGD. Um, the number, total number is about 80 patients. The mean age was 24, uh, but age is anywhere between six, uh, 16 and 30 and 60 years of age. And what you saw, what you can see is that these patients have two big clinical categories. There's the infectious care categories here, and this is a curve that just looks at event-free survival um, on the um, y-axis and on the x-axis is age um, in years. And so the, everybody has an infection, and all patients have a sentinel infection as their first manifestation of disease. And these infections occur before you start seeing some of the inflammatory complications. And these inflammatory complications um, are occurring um, a little later, um, usually in the, in the teenage years. Um, but if you look at the mean age at the first inflammatory event is around 12 years of age. Uh, whereas your first infection is usually before the age of one for the most, for the classic X-linked, and these are mainly X-linked patients. What's the definition of inflammatory? Yeah, events? so very important. These, these, these are enteritis, um, uh, nephritis. Um, these are granulomas. The non-infectious. Um, non-infectious, yeah. And... And so the most common ones being GI and enteritis. Um, and the, the autoimmune phenomena are really interesting, uh, almost 18% of these patients. Um, and right now, of, the, uh, of these autoimmune patients, with, and there have been patients diagnosed with lupus, but cytopenias are very important as well. And right now we have uh, a, a young CGD patient with ITP, very difficult to, to manage and uh, to treat. Um, so these are uh, problems that start occurring as, uh, as, as, as these patients have lived longer um, and really are important contributors to um, more, morbidity. So what, why do they develop autoimmunity? So that's a great question. I don't think people understand that very well. Um, the other um, point uh, I want to make here is that if you look at the types of infections um, that you see, uh, if the younger patients will tend to have the um, lymphadenitis, for example, the older patients may have more of the pulmonary diseases over time. Um, the in terms of long-term outcomes, in, in, in terms of the differences in the annual frequencies of both infection and inflammatory 
uh, diseases. This is these are graphs. I'm not sure if you can see it. This is zero here and zero here. And what we're looking at is the uh, comparison of infections occurring before the age of 16 and after the age of 16, before the age of 16 and after. And so there's really no significant difference um, in terms of these inflammatory flares occurring before or after and these infection flares occurring before and after. So it really is occurring throughout the life uh, span of the individual. Um, but like I said before, the, the infectious um, pulmonary infections are occurring a little bit more commonly in the adult patients um, and versus in the, um, the younger patients. And in terms of the inflammatory, um, and not uncommonly that you can get these um, skin granulomas. Um, um, and uh, one of the contributors to morbidity um, and mortality is um, these inflammatory failures, very similar to what we're seeing um, in some of the CGD and uh, CDID patients, uh, if you compare infectious versus um, inflammatory complications. And if you look at, and these are Kaplan-Meier curves, this is a, this is a study of, of 507 patients um, from, um, oops, this is uh, 19, I think this is 1995 to 2016 patients. 50 of them underwent transplant. And this upper one, um, this is the overall survival uh, of patients with CGD and the two uh, lines here are the confidence intervals. When they compared transplant versus no transplant, there was no difference in overall survival. And when you compared those who were transplanted and looked at survival over transplant, you can see that the survival was pretty good, but there was, um, you know, the confidence intervals between 60 and 90 uh, percent. And then if you go to transplant, there was a statistical difference in terms of age. In other words, if you took them to transplant before the age of 14 versus um, after the age of 14, there was a statistical difference with a P of uh, 0 0.0035, it's, uh, but anyway. So this is something to think about, and that's why people are moving to transplantation for um, this is another slide, again, just to show you that um, this is a cohort from Italy, and what you can see is that uh, years from diagnosis, the survival anywhere around 50% at around 25 years. So um, it, th we are good at making the diagnosis. We're good at taking care of the young children, but we have to be thinking <coughs> about these patients as they move into adulthood. I know this is probably an off-the-wall question, but since you know exactly what gene you need to put in, could you just take out their own stem cells and put the gene in there and then reinfuse them with their own stem yeah. cells with the gene corrected? Correct. And gene therapy is um, being yeah. done for chronic granulomatous disease. In the U.S. The, or not in the U.S.? Yes, here in the U.S. Oh. In fact, my first patient that I showed you was one of the first patients who underwent gene therapy. He's now he was 18 when they did it. He's now 21. He's doing really well um, by the group at NIH, Harry Malik. Um, there's still, uh, it's not still clear, um, and that's a topic of talks, but uh, a different talk, but um, the vector, uh, the, they have used different vectors um, with the new uh, vectors, uh, there doesn't seem to be a risk of the oncogenesis that was uh, noted in um, the first vectors that were used for different uh, PID. Um, the question is, you know, how long is it sustainable and um, are they, um, are, are, you know, what's the long-term outcomes? And that's still data that's been discussed and published in, in abstract form. I haven't seen the final um, the data on paper and manuscripts for the CGD, but yes, absolutely. So my point is that these are important long-term outcomes and quality of life is another aspect that, that when you have to think about these diseases um, as we move forward because we've, we've looked at a lot of survival curves and it's not so much the survival, but it's also the quality of life of those survivals 
And so people are moving to, um, to other therapies. Okay, so let me just give you another. Before you leave this disease, just a historical one. I know at least Frank and Bill will resonate with this. So the head of AID before Bill was a man named Seymour Klebanov, whose entire career was this disease. And just for younger people here who've never heard that name before, uh, I would say he's one of the leaders uh, in unraveling what was wrong in this disease. And uh, Bill worked with him directly for many years of his career. And he died a couple of years ago. I don't know if you were on the faculty before Seymour died. No, I was not. Or met the man. No. Um, so he was a mentor to some of the older people, myself included, in this room, and the superb teachers, a clinician who never practiced, really. He, he really was functioned as a PhD and a, and a researcher, but a great man. Yep. <clears throat> okay, I'm going to change gears a little bit. I'm going to uh, talk about this patient. This is a teenage boy. He's 16 now. Um, and he comes to your practice. He's on IVIG, actually. He's been on IVIG since he was two. And he was diagnosed by um, a pulmonologist at the age of two with uh, hypogam. And he had, um, he, you know, recurrent infections at the age of two. And at that time, um, the IgG was in the, at the age of two was 260. He didn't have any A. And his IgM was sort of borderline, but nothing, you know, dramatic. Um, so despite being on gamma globulin, he still had a history of chronic sinusitis, he had asthma, he had moderate to mild to neutropenia throughout. Oh, and by the way, his brother just got admitted into the ICU with pneumocystis pneumonia. So which test will confirm the diagnosis in your patient? Will you get, you know all about CTK? Will you get genetic testing about with um, Bruton's tyrosine kinase? Will you look at C40 ligand on the surface of T cells? Will you look at genetic testing for the interferon gamma receptor? Will you check the IL-2 receptor gamma? Uh, I'm sorry, alpha, or would you just order some mitogens and antigens? How many people say one? How many people say two? Mm -hmm. Very good. So, hyper IgM is a group of disorders. They're a group of um, defects in class four tree combination. And um, they're both X-linked formed and autosomal recessive forms. And I would, I would <coughs> encourage you to look at your patients with on IVIG, male patients on IVIG, um, who really don't have any IgA, um, to, and if things are starting to change, to relook at those patients and don't just call them CBID, because I think you're going to find these patients there. The most common of these defects in class one tree combination is the X-linked form of hyper-IgM, and that is due to mutations in the CD40 ligand gene. And these patients, um, in addition to the classic uh, recurrent infections, have a unique, unique propensity to opportunistic infections, and specifically pneumocystis. So if you see a baby with pneumocystis, they have either skid, either hyper-IgM, uh, even XLA um, or HIV, of course. But those are your four differential diagnoses of any uh, infant with uh, pneumocystis um, as well. The other sort of sentinel and uh, important offender is cryptosporidium. And, uh, and cryptosporidium associated subsequently liver disease, history of um, sclerosing cholangitis, these are all clinical manifestations of this disease. About 50% of them will have neutropenia. Um, Parvovirus mm -hmm. can, induce, can induce a really se severe aplastic anemia, very difficult to manage. And unique 
to this particular immunodeficiency is the development of neural endocrine tumors, mainly of the GI tract. <laughs> Classically, laboratory findings in these <laughs> patients will be, if you can't switch, you can't make A. So usually they're all uh, A deficient. You may have some G depending on the age of the patient. The younger the child, the higher your G. The M may be normal the younger your child, but tends to increase as time goes by. And um, you can do flow analysis and genetic testing for CD40 ligand. So, um, so I became interested in this disease because um, this mom here um, came to me when she was pregnant. And she had three brothers who had died. She had an uncle who had died, two cousins who had died. She knew she was a carrier, and she was a carrier of a boy, um, and she was pregnant. She was seven months pregnant. And she came to me because she said, um, I want this baby. The moment this baby comes out, I want this baby diagnosed, and I want this baby taken to transplant immediately. <laughs> and she was an Indian ancestry, and the husband was um, uh, uh, Italian ancestry. So the concern was, in my mind, with this, and the, the baby, and she, there was no other child. She was pregnant with this baby. So the baby was delivered, and sure enough, the baby was uh, a male and was affected. So the question is, okay, we need to go to transplant. But the baby didn't have any matches. <clears throat> and why did she want to go to transplant? Because if in the 1990s, I was a fellow when um, this disease was uh, diagnosed. It was really exciting times. Um, and, um, and so uh, several years afterwards, this was awful. This is a Kaplan-Meier curve of the survival of patients with uh, an X-linked uh, hyper IgM by you know, the, the, about 20% uh, survival by the age of the mid 20s. And so what happened is that, that you know a lot of people were starting to, there was one case, then there were three cases, then there was a series, then you know in the subsequent 10 years, people were taking these patients to transplant with fairly good outcomes. But here I had this baby who had no HLA match, and the mom had a very simple question. What's the long-term outcome of patients comparing transplant versus no transplant in an era where you can use preventative antibiotics and you can prophylax for uh, pneumocystis, et cetera, et cetera? What's the difference? Well, there was no data. And so that's what led me to complete the study that was published in Jackie. And we compiled 176 patients with hyper, X-linked hyper-IgM uh, from 1964 to 2013. Obviously, this required a, a multinational um, effort uh, from patients from all over the world to compile these. So the thought is that the prevalence is maybe one in a million. I think it's much less, but, um, but that's what is, was previously reported. So um, the mean, a, mean year of diagnosis was 2002. About 77% of patients had an um, established molecular diagnosis. We had patients that were diagnosed at birth, but also diagnosed in the, in the 60s. About 44% had a positive family history. Um, and the follow-up time was anywhere between uh, a month to 60 years and uh, with the mean follow-up time about 30 years. And so if you just, I won't show you all the data, but if you looked, if you, depending on where you lived, the chances of being taken, being, going to transplant were different. So if you lived in the Middle East or Australia, you didn't go to transplant. If you lived in Europe, you had a much higher chance of going to transplant as compared to North America or South America, which was an interesting. Unfortunately, this is the Kaplan-Meier curve of these 176 patients. 
with a median survival time of 25 at, uh, since diagnosis of 25 years. And the punchline showed no difference in, in survival in terms of transplant versus no transplant. But we also asked, say again? No. <laughs> if you looked at the landscape, we also asked for landscape and Karnofsky scores, which are scores of the activities of daily living. We didn't do exactly quality of life, but there was an improvement in those that um, had been transplanted versus had not been transplanted. So transplant seems to uh, favor those patients um, in terms of quality of life. But which were the predictors of mortality? The most important predictor of mortality was liver disease. Is that because of graft versus host disease? Or? Liver disease at presentation. At liver, at presentation. The most mm -hmm. important, not the infectious, not the pulmonary disease, liver disease. What, what have you segregated by age at the time of the transplant? Them very early. Yes, so if you took the patients to transplant less than 10 years, um, you had the best survival. I, I, I don't have, you know, I don't have all the slides with you, with me, but, um, and your overall survival for transplant was in the 80%. So, but if you compare transplant to no transplant, um, there wasn't a significant a difference in survival. This took a long time to get published because nobody believed the data. <laughs> Especially if you were a transplanter, you didn't want to see that. But this is what worries me. And this is my patient, seven years of age, who I had been monitoring, who was the brother of the, kid, the child that I presented at three months of age, presented with pneumocystis. And so I followed him and we put him on prophylaxis and did everything and then came to see me just for a routine and um, he looked uh, he, he looked jaundiced and he had a abdominal mass right upper quadrant abdominal mass um, and what you can see is a huge gallbladder here but there's no tumor nothing no tumor just this huge gallbladder but when we did the endoscopy this is a normal ampulla and this is the patient's at home. And this is a neuroendocrine tumor um, of the impulse. Extremely rare in a seven-year-old developed, had to get undergo a Whipple and, um, cert and chemotherapy. And this is a table from that um, paper as well. And what you can see is that the incidence of malignancies in these patients is about 5%. And um, but with incredible mortality, all of them died except for two who had undergone transplant. One had AML, which wasn't really a neuroendocrine tumor. So all the others were neuroendocrine tumors. And the other one had um, sort of dysplastic type of uh, uh, changes in, that resulted in complete colectomy. And then went to straight to transplant because his brother had died. So how do you treat patients with, uh, um, oops, this guy. What? You blocked this one. Oops. And did the mutations segregate to who no. had malignancy or? No. So how do you, how, how to treat these patients? There's still a lot of um, gamma globulin you need. You need to place them on pneumocystis prophylaxis. Some people will use azithromycin, but there's not uh, clear data on azithromycin prophylaxis for uh, cryptosporidium. GCSF, if they're neutropenic, um, all should be followed, in my opinion, by GI. Um, I type all of the patients, uh, and, uh, and uh, we discuss transplant. Um, and in, in terms of surveillance, what type of surveillance do you do? It's not clear. And so this, this and, and for malignancy, what type of imaging do you do? So it's not clear. But I think that as long as we're thinking about these things, it's important to, to make the, the diagnosis. Okay, 
Let's see, what time is it? Do I have a, 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 a few? Just before you leave that, why do they have some IgG if they can't class switch? Because everything, um, <laughs> I think, it, well, the younger kids is because they have maternal transfer of IgG, and then they hold on to it. Um, <clears throat> And um, there, these, all of these diseases sometimes are, are called what we call leaky. Um, and some, sometimes you can have some switching to some extent, or you just maintain and the catabolic rate of your IgG is, is low, you know, is very, very low. They hang on to um, whatever little IgG they have. So it's not usually absolute. For the most part, maybe you may have the, some, some, a little bit of class switching. There are some mutations, Bill, that um, are associated with perhaps a, a milder phenotype. Um, Troy and Hans published that, um, you know, a few mutations, but, but that's still to be, you know, confirmed. Okay. Um, let me talk about uh, this patient, a 26-year-old male with recurrent abscesses. Got skin boils since um, he was a child, mainly our MSSA. He's had pneumonia and sinus infections. He's had eczema. Um, he has had several fractures, and some of his baby teeth <coughs> had to be pulled out. And on exam, you note that he has multiple scars, skin is dry, and has some folliculitis. And the diagnosis is? Hyper-IG. Hyper-IG, very good. I don't have to tell you much about this. Um, just um, just to, to um, point out that um, I like to use this wonderful um, Grimbacher score um, that uh, sort of segregates the patients. This was, this was published before the genetics were identified. And so patients, uh, and uh, here are your clinical features, and you can give points depending on what your um, uh, uh, levels, uh, in, depending on the clinical features. And so in general, patients that score above uh, 40 um, can are, you know, you have a pretty good chance of <coughs> having a, a mutation in STAT3. Um, and it's a loss of function of STAT3. But um, so one of the difficulties is really distinguishing the patients with severe atopic dermatitis from patients with hyper IgE, because patients with severe atopic dermatitis, in my experience, have the highest IgEs than compared to the patients with hyper IgE. In fact, um, my patients. You know, some of the patients with hyper IgE, their IgEs are in the 200 range or so. Certainly, there are patients with high IgEs, but the, the highest, the 20,000, up to 30,000 IgEs I've seen in bad atopic dermatitis. <coughs> so, just some clinical pearls. <clears throat> patients with atopic dermatitis do not get deep seated infections with staph aureus. Um, they can have superficial superinfections, but they don't get abscesses and they don't get deep-seated infections. Um, and uh, these patients with hyper IgE are not atopic, whereas patients with atopic dermatitis tend to be atopic. So trying to distinguish that and really getting a good history for the infectious is what's going to guide you one way or the other. And of course, when in doubt, sequencing. When you have an elevated Ig, I think in my experience, it's one of the easiest tests to get approved for sequencing of STAT3. So, um, and Quest Diagnostics and some of these commercial laboratories offers that very quickly. Um, okay, and this is my last case that I just wanted to go over a different one. Um, this is a boy who, um, with a history of recurrent thrush, uh, molluscan, and liver disease. So this is a male, and he um, started with uh, a lot of respiratory issues, but didn't start until the age of four. He had a history of atopic dermatitis. He had some disseminated uh, cutaneous viral uh, infections. He had molluscum. He had um, plantar uh, warts. Um, he had the recurrent um, other types of wards. He had a lot of candidiasis. He had cryptosporidium. Um, he had sclerosing cholangitis and portal fibrosis. And his sister had been diagnosed with the stage lung and liver disease. 
Fence. What is this type of presentation? I'll show you pictures here. This is, you can see, really extensive molluscum all over. And these are some planar uh, warts. And these are another type, more planar warts. The white patches, these are uh, flat warts here. So you've got a patient with recurrent infections, right? Sinopulmonary infections. You also have viral infections, right? And you have, you know, opportunistic infections. It sounds like the hyper IgM, right? That I just told you about. But I think of those as combined deficiencies, right? Because you have both viral, you have bacterial. Um, so I think of them as uh, combined deficiencies. And um, he was the product of uh, uh, cousins, and this is the sister. And uh, we published this paper. Um, uh, this is the sister, and this is the patient. And what you can see is that um, these are the clinical manifestations. And, um, and the score that I just told you about was less than, than 40. And so this is an area when uh, genetic testing was not readily available. Um, and, um, you know, these were the labs that we had. Um, the patient had very high elevated IgG, normal A, normal M, elevated E, had normal tetanus but absent pneumococcal titers, um, lymphopenic for the most part, and mitogens and antigens were abnormal. So this was a patient who was, to me, a combined immune deficiency, uh, probably autosomal recessive. Uh, given the history of consanguinity. And um, to make a long story short, we did uh, RNA sequencing and found an uh, intronic mutation in DOC8. So um, at the time, patients with DOC8 were very similar to patients with uh, hyper IgE, um, but these, this patient didn't have all the classic features of hyper IgE, had the liver disease, had more of a combined immune deficiency. Um, and when we looked at um, the flow for DOC8, you can see that this is the control and there's barely any uh, um, DOC8. And so what is DOC8? Um, it's really, uh, it's a guanine nucleotide exchange factor that is present in lymphocytes, but it has incredible different function because it it's, uh, regulates actin um, cytoskeleton. And so, it, it has a role in polarization, in adhesion, in, um, in the regulation of the phosphorylation of SAF3, um, also in the cytolytic granule release. Um, it's important in the actin um, polymerization that occurs uh, thanks to WASP um, and in uh, Treg. So this is why these patients have this very variable clinical phenotype with features of hyper IgE and features of Wiscott Aldridge, uh, and some of them may develop autoimmunity. Um, so it's a, it's a very interesting disease that initially was described as an autosomal recessive form of hyper IgE, but it's much broader really than just that. And you can see a combined immune deficiency with immune dysregulation. And this is, you know, this is a study of 136 patients with a DOC8 deficiency in um, infection, um, cerebral events, including strokes and malignancies are um, reported in these patients. So there's a push now to think about transplantation for some of these patients, although that's not been, there's no real good published data to think about it. But this is a very broad, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, a disease that really exemplifies um, all of the aspects that you need for normal immune function. So think of the combined immune deficiencies. There are many of them, but the take-home message, I think, is the clinical phenotype, right? So you can see both bacterial, you can see viral infections, you can see features of autoimmunity. So those are those are those combined immune deficiency. And if you're in that, in that, and, and you're seeing this clinical phenotype of combined immune deficiency, I think there's justification to move to um, genetic testing 
because while there are some unique features for all of these different disorders, right, um, the, the reality is that until you do the genetics, you're not going to um, make the diagnosis. So with that, we'll end, and this is your word of the day. It happens to be space. Um, the, um, the, the, uh, just the other point I want to make is um, this is the IUIS uh, 2017, and there is a new one that's going to be coming out, the greatest and the latest, um, in December, January of this year. Uh, published in Journal of Allergy, uh, Journal of Clinical Immunology, uh, which uh, uh, will be really uh, helpful with the updated version. Now, 400 and something genes <laughs> to try to keep up with. Yes, sir. So you've emphasized the long-term outcomes, I think, quite properly. But my question is, what happens to these kids as they get older? How long does children's follow them? What happens if they move? Do they get a laminated card to carry in their wallet with some information on it so that anybody who sees them and circumstances can understand what's going on with them? Yeah. Um, most of us who's been, who've been taking care of pediatric patients uh, and primary immune deficiency we keep them uh, for a long time. There's been, there's been uh, 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 the, the good news is that we are seeing as these patients move into adulthood and grow into adulthood, there's been an interest within our community of allergy immunologists, adult trained physicians who have an interest in primary immunodeficiency. And there's a goal in most of the academic centers to create these transition clinics, very similar to what happened with uh, CF. Um, but most of these patients stay within academic centers within the pediatric group. Fortunately, we have Allie here who's interested in some of these patients, and we're gonna, um, she's going to be seeing a lot of these uh, adult patients. But I think it's critical that we create these transition clinics. Um, and these patients can be cared for all any, you know, a good, all they need is a good doctor to take care of them. Um, but it is good to be part of academic institutions at some point because of the advances of how things are moving in terms of um, gene, you know, gene therapies or gene corrected uh, uh, therapies, for example, for hyper IgM and all of these uh, uh, novel diseases. So I think we're in a new era. Um, it, we, you know, um, uh, try, that, that's one of my biggest fears is because uh, while they're in the pediatric world, um, they have insurance, but when they move out into the uh, adult world, that insurance may go away. So part of our education is making sure these kids are in school, that they in school, they get good grades, they, you know, we pushed a lot of that type of education so that they recognize that they need to get a job to be able to function and be able to uh, to have insurance. So yeah, we um, you know it's a it's a community that we all know each other. We try to find uh, people to care for them as they move. The Immune Deficiency Foundation is a really good resource for patients. Uh, these patient organization. Immune Deficiency Foundation, Jeffrey Modell Foundation, those are the two big organizations that really are very helpful. Next to last slide with the umbrella on it, this one. Is it, that doesn't seem to even be fully comprehensive of the classic skids. Oh, no, yes. So combined immune deficiency um, is sort of a separate, that's a good point, a separate entity from the skid. The combined defects are both T and B cell defects, but not as severe as the, as the skid patients. These patients don't die within the first year, two years of life. Um, these patients may be diagnosed in childhood, um, some of which may be diagnosed a little later in adolescent years. Um, so they, they survive. Uh, they have some function, like for example, the the boy that I just showed you. He had, you know, he made um, antibodies to tetanus. He didn't make antibodies to pneumococcus. So there's some function there. Um, so these patients are usually not as severely compromised as the skin patients. Thank you. Yeah. Uh,